Good afternoon. This is Donna Patterson, and this is a webinar that's being provided um, to talk about waiver nursing delegation for the individual options waiver, the level one waiver, and the self waiver. Um, obviously, waiver delegation has been in place for some time. However, there's not been any mechanism for reimbursement uh, until now, and we do have a new rule. We're going to go over that as well as uh, how do you account for uh, the reimbursement rate onto your CPT and into your monthly uh, waiver funding levels? We'll start first with just going over uh, the rule. You can access it through the Ohio Administrative Code uh, 5123-2-9-37. Uh, and as I say, it will be in place effective uh, February the 1st. But it gives you an overall outlook of what exactly is is this rule all about and what it is is that it first is going to define uh, what is nursing delegation it's going to establish the provider qualifications who can be the nurse delegation uh, person who cannot um, who can bill for this what are the expectations with respect to uh, the service delivery and for the documentation and then of course uh, the payments Waiver nursing delegation means that the activities are re that are related to transferring the responsibility of a performance of a specific nursing task from a licensed person to that of one who does not hold a nursing license. It has two components. First, there will be assessments, and then the other component will be the consultation. The assessment must be performed by an RN. And that's going to be uh, the person that goes in and conducts a comprehensive assessment of an individual to determine that it's appropriate uh, to delegate this task uh, based upon the stability of the individual um, and the competency of, of that provider. And once that has been determined, then of course the services can be put into place. But this has to be done at least initially and then of course with any significant uh, change of condition of that individual uh, or change in their treatment or interventions uh, that would require a reassessment before uh, any uh, a person who is non-licensed could perform any task. The consultation uh, can be performed either by an RN or an LPN, and that's um, the consultation visit will be to consult with the individual or if there's a, a the physician that's ordered this particular task uh, that needs clarification or confirmation, and then of course uh, communication with the individual or the non-licensed person who is performing that task. So we'll first look at assessment visits. As I said, the assessment can only be done by an RN, uh, and it's going to be that initial assessment and to get an overall assessment of that individual's uh, health, uh, their uh, current orders, um, their overall medical condition and that uh, the non-licensed person's ability to perform those tasks and is it appropriate uh, for a delegation uh, to be performed for this particular individual. So we can have an assessment visit. An individual can have an assessment visit up to one every 60 days um, for the individual in their residential setting and you can have one waiver nursing assessment every 60 days in the individual's adult day services setting. And the waiver nursing delegation, the assessment, may be billed sequentially to, but not concurrently with, the waiver nursing delegation or consultation. So if I'm there, if I'm the RN and I'm there uh, doing a consultation, we're reviewing the physician's orders or we're going over an intervention or we're, uh, there's a demonstration uh, for competency, I cannot bill for the assessment of that individual at the same time that I'm performing the consultation visit. I can do it before the consultation visit or I can do it after, but it can't be uh, at the same time. Uh, when I'm making an assessment visit, I should be there just to perform that, and it can be followed by or pre, uh, preceded by uh, a consultation with the individual and the uh, non-licensed person who's performing the task. There are requirements with respect to the documentation, um, and these are listed specifically out in the rule, um, but I just wanted to touch a few uh, highlights, and that is uh, you, you, must have to, you must document uh, what is the precipitating factor 
indicating why this assessment was needed. Was the individual discharged from the hospital? Was there a significant change of condition that would require a, a change of interventions? Or is it the initiation of the waiver nursing delegation uh, who had not previously received any delegation, but now we're about to initiate that. So there's three separate times, uh, hospital discharge, significant change, or the initiation of services. <clears throat> so the consultation visit, uh, what exactly is the consultation? And that's where you're going to evaluate the ability of the unlicensed person to perform that task. Uh, you're gonna make sure that they've had the prerequisite, uh, if I could say that word, prerequisite training, and you're going to have them do a return demonstration of any particular task uh, that you are delegating to them. So you're gonna go in to make sure that the individual who's going to be performing that task has the capability. They've had the training that's required. For an example, if it's a, uh, let's say it's a men, and men through the, uh, G-Tube, have they completed certification level one as well as certification level two? Um, you're also going to, to, a part of this consultation visit is gonna be the development and implementation of the plan. That is, you're gonna go over the meds, the treatments that have been ordered by the doctor. You're going to create an individual specific instructions uh, for performing that task. You're going to identify expected outcomes of the delegated nursing task, identify any potential uh, adverse effects of the prescribed medications uh, that are being administered under the nursing delegation. You're gonna provide instructions for documenting when a delegated task is completed or omitted. You're going to confirm meds or supplies necessary for the delegated task. Are they available in the service setting? And completing the delegation related documentation such as the medication administration records. Part of the consultation visit will also include an evaluation of the progress of the nursing delegation, consulting with the individual who's receiving the services, the physician or unlicensed personnel performing those tasks, whether that is in a face-to-face -face contact or whether you're on a telephone or teleconferencing, video conferencing, or any other means. And it's going to be reviewing the delegation-related documentation, such as the med and men records, any progress notes, physician's orders, or a hospital discharge record or the continuity sheet uh, from the hospital. So what are the qualifications to be the uh, nursing, uh, the RN who's delegating the task? And this must be a, uh, the person with an, with an RN or an LPN who uh, has a current valid unrestricted license in the um, state of Ohio. They must be working within their scope of practice as it's outlined in the OBN rule, uh, chapter 4723 of the revised codes. And the applicant must be seeking approval to provide or have the approval as well. You have to have certification to perform this particular task or to bill for it. Uh, in other words, you have to have gone through the application process. You have to have an uh, ODM billing number uh, because this, uh, both the consultation and the assessment will be billed through MITS. It will not be through PAWS or the EMBS system, it will be through MITS. So that has to be uh, an application and certification to be able to uh, bill for this particular service. So who cannot provide waiver nursing delegation? The county board or the COG uh, cannot be providers of nursing delegation uh, and bill for that service. Also, the family member who lives with that individual cannot be the waiver nursing delegation person and be reimbursed for that visit. So the requirements for service delivery when an individual is receiving waiver nursing delegation in multiple settings and or for multiple providers, the team shall determine and specify in the individual support plan the allocation of the waiver nursing delegation assessment or the consultation. And again, as I, as from the beginning, we said with the assessment, you can have, uh, you're allowed up to one every 60 days in the residential setting or one every 60 days in the adult uh, day center. 
uh, their services, the adult day services. So that has to be agreed upon through the uh, county board, a case manager, or SSA. Uh, there has to be a determination of who's going to build, uh, not only for the assessments and when those are going to be built, but also for the consultation. There's a set number of hours, and uh, we're going to get to that where you can build up to 10 hours again, but there has to be a, an allocation of those hours as to who are going, who will be allowed uh, to bill for what services and for how, how many hours per month. So an individual, oh, there it is. An individual may receive up to one waiver nursing, and I'm not going to say nursing delegation. This is just the assessment, and that's every 60 days in the residential setting as well as one every 60 days in the adult day services setting. And then the individual can receive up to 10 hours of the consultation each month, regardless of the numbers of, pro uh, of providers of that particular service. So you may have five different providers of the consultation, or you may have one provider, but regardless of the number of providers you may have, it's still 10 hours per month. Uh, it may be that they bill for less than that. Let's say, for example, you have uh, just one provider. They may not require the 10 hours per month. So obviously, they would bill for that. That would be the requirement of them. But the maximum number that any individual can have billed against their MMIS number or their Medicaid number is the maximum of 10. So regardless of the provider or the setting. So it's not you know, in the assessment visit, we talked about you can have one every 60 days in the residential setting and one every 60 days uh, in the adult day services. In in this particular, in the consultation rule, it doesn't matter if it's in the adult day services, if it's in the home setting, wherever it happens to be, it's a maximum of 10 hours. So again, this is going to require a meeting with the county board um, manager, case manager, SSA, along with the different providers so that there's an understanding of what uh, assessment consultation services are going to be provided by whom and the the quantity uh, that should be billed. Obviously, if we have people that are billing too much, then there's not going to be enough money to go around for everyone to be paid. What does nursing delegation not include? It does not include participating in the ISP development. Uh, it does not include consulting with the individual's teams on matters that are not specifically related to that delegation of that for that individual. Uh, it does not include directly providing the nursing services yourself. Uh, it does not include coordinating uh, the individual's health care. It does not include conducting general health-related training for unlicensed personnel are conducting any training uh, as it's outlined in Chapter 5123-2-6. So those expectations that have all been outlined in rule, it's, it's not for that purpose. This is strictly for the purpose of the assessment being done by the RN, either post-hospital, a significant change, or initiation of services, and a consultation on an ongoing visit uh, for matters that are particular to the care of that individual and the ability of that uh, non-licensed person to perform that task. So what exactly does the documentation have to include? Uh, it has to include the type of service, the date of the service, the place of the service. Again, because you know, as I was saying with the assessment, there, there can be two different locations, one being you know, the, the home, one being the adult-based services. You have to have the name of the individual who's receiving and the MMIS number or the, the Medicaid number, and the name of the provider, and of course their uh, written or electronic signature. You must give a description and the details of the services that's being delivered that directly relate to the services specified in the approved service plan, including the name of the unlicensed person for whom you were doing the supervisory, for whom there was a supervisory visit was performed, the number of units. I'll talk about that briefly, uh, and then we'll talk about it again uh, later when we're looking at the allocation in the CPT. The consultation is paid in 15-minute increments or, or subsequent units. Uh, so, if you're there, if you're if you're doing your consultation visit for 45 minutes, then it 
is three units. The assessment, on the other hand, is just a one unit. Uh, regardless of the amount of time that it may take you to perform that assessment, you're just paid, uh, the nursing delegation person will just be paid a, a flat rate. Um, so we've got units of time for the consultation and then just a, a flat rate for the assessment. Uh, those of you who have worked with waiver nursing or state plan PDN nursing or state plan home health nursing, uh, you're familiar with the RN assessment and delegation because uh, the same holds true in that um, in that instance when you've got an RN supervising an LPN and they're doing their assessment every 60 days to do a uh, update of their plan of care of the 485. Uh, they are billing at a flat rate for that individual to perform the assessment. If there's a consultation with the LPN, then it's a 15-minute unit, and the same is holding true with uh, the nursing delegation assessment consultation. One is by a unit, by a flat rate, and one is by units of time. So on your notes, you have to include uh, the beginning and the end of the service. Um, in addition, for the documentation, now this is in particular to the assessment. Uh, it has to include any of the precipitating factors as to why this assessment is needed. And again, I think I've said this several times, but just to be sure that you know that the assessment has to include the reason for, for your assessment. Was the individual just discharged from the hospital? Uh, has there been a significant change that may have caused the change in the interventions that are being provided? Or is this the initiation of that uh, waiver nursing delegation? Uh, the documentation for the consultation shall include a description of the details of the consultation purpose. And again, um, we talked about earlier what exactly um, could be provided during those consultation visits. And your documentation has to include exactly who are you working with, what were you working on, and what was the outcome? Both of the person uh, that is providing the consultation as well as the uh, non-licensed person who's receiving uh, the service. Now, talking about billing. CPT, just like you account for the services now for the waiver nursing and the state plan PDN and home health services um, because the providers of those services are billing through MITS and this service, uh, is also going to be billed uh, through MITS, of which you do need to account for the service and the service hours uh, in your CPT uh, because that is the only way that we're going to have the money allocated uh, on, a monthly, um, on a monthly basis to be sent over to CRM, which is sent from CRM over to the Ohio Benefits and from Ohio Benefits to MITS, and the provider is going to bill MITS directly. So here's the, here's the payment rate. For RN assessment, uh, as I said before, this is just per assessment, it's a flat rate. The billing code is going to be G0493, and it will require a U9 modifier. Now, those of you I talked earlier about, you know, the RN assessment consultation that's been associated with a waiver nursing and state plan, um, for the RN assessment, they did not require a modifier, but it was required with the consultation. So there may be a little bit of confusion with uh, with the delegation, the U9 modifiers associated with the assessment, whereas when it's nursing delegation and assessment, the U9 is the U9 modifiers associated with the consultation rather than the assessment. But at any rate, for this service, the RN assessment, you do use the G0493. Uh, and it does have a, a U9 modifier. It's a flat rate. An agency will receive $37.08 uh, for that assessment, and a non-agency or an independent provider uh, will receive $31.64. For the consultation, uh, and as we said earlier, a consultation can be provided by an RN or an LPN working under the supervision of an RN. Uh, the billing is going to be provided in 15-minute units. The code is, again, G0493, and that G code, you probably picked up on this, is that's for an RN, G0493. What indicates to MITS as to whether this is a consultation visit or the assessment visit will be the presence of that U9 modifier. And again, you as the county board uh, are not that concerned with the U9, but the 
provider certainly will be. And in case you're ever asked or they call and say, I'm having a hard time, I'm not getting paid, then you'll at least be familiar with, yes, we had the same G0493 as for the RN consultation or assessment, but did you use the U9 modifier? Uh, the 15 minute rate for an agency is gonna be 832, and for a non-agency uh, provider, an RN provider, um, the 15 minute rate is going to be 696. Now this is for the LPN, and again, working under the supervision of an RN, but if the LPN is performing that consultation visit, uh, whether it is a face-to-face uh, -face or telecommunications or video conferencing or whatever manners it's being uh, performed, uh, again, they're gonna be billing in those 15 minute units. And in this case, the billing code will be G0494. There will not be a modifier. Again, remember, an LPN is not going to be performing an assessment, only the RN. So you would only use the U9 modifier with the G0493 that's an RN doing the assessment. So because this is a consultation visit, as with the RN that did not require the U9, then this also does not require U9. It's just simply the G0494 uh, billing code and the rate will be for an agency 737 for one 15 minute unit and for a non-agency rate, it's 588. So now we're gonna look at <clears throat> how you're gonna put that onto the CPT and how's it gonna look once you have it all entered. So when you're going to assign the delegation for the individual and you're gonna assign it to a provider, you're gonna to go to MSS and you're gonna access the individual's uh, CPT information, just like you do for nursing and your other waiver services um, as you do it now. Um, you will click on that Manage Waiver Nursing Delegation Service. You see, I've highlighted it um, at the bottom there, the Manage Waiver Nursing. Now, you would have already entered in the provider information, and again, all the providers must have a certification in order to bill um, for this particular service. For the RN assessment or the consultation, they must have the certification. Because if they don't and you continue on with the CPT, I'll show you later, but it's going to be, you're going to get an error message, so it will not let you submit it. So at any rate, you go to the Manage Waiver Nursing uh, Delegation Service under that CPT menu, and then from there, you're going to um, click on the add a provider and you will uh, choose that service. There's going to be a, a little drop down box that's going to say the only selection you can choose is this is going to be a monthly uh, cost allocation. Despite the fact that I said to you that you can only do it every 60 days, you will account for this on a monthly basis, but your ISP will certainly allocate it only to be every 60 days uh, maximum. And then of course, MITS also has uh, an audit tool that says that how often can this service uh, be allocated? But you will see on your CPT that it's gonna be on a monthly basis. Because uh, you will be monitoring the cost, uh, not only from your CPT, but those of you who go into the data warehouse, uh, you'll be pulling that information again, because if there are billing issues, the county board um, can go into the data warehouse and see exactly uh, what provider billed, for what services they bill for, and for how many units. Because you're gonna have that team meeting because everyone's only gonna be given the 10 hours for the consultation, and you're gonna have to make the decision of who's gonna be billing for what services or how many hours or whatever units you're gonna allocate out to all the providers, uh, and then that's what they have to bill against. So that's information that you, number one, you're gonna know what you've allocated in your CPT, and then number two, uh, on your ISP, number three, being in your uh, data warehouse uh, that will show you exactly what's been billed. So you'll put, um, you'll allocate how often this provider, you'll have a start date, and you see, I think I have this on the next slide. Well, let me go back. At any rate, you're going to enter this information uh, of, as to it's a monthly, and you're gonna have a start date and an end date 
let's say that your waiver span started maybe in January, but this particular uh, individual didn't start providing services until March. So you'll uh, select on the calendar whatever date in March, and then of course, let's say that it goes to the end of December, but this provider quits for whatever reason in June. And so you can start date and stop date, and they will have their name appear only during that time. Uh, that is like in this example, you see Harris, where there's a start date of 2:27 and an end date of 4:30, and then Justin is also a provider, but he did not start until 3:1 and ended on 5:31. Now you see on this uh, particular example, there's on the waiver span date, it has 6:117 and ends on 5:31:18. So of course, uh, even if Justin was continuing to provide service. You could not put an end date that's going to go obviously beyond the waiver span. It would be in your next waiver span period. Um, if you're entering the information, let's say that in January, you know that this is going to be a service that's in place and you're going to go ahead and enter this information because it's going to be available to you. It's just not going to start paying until February the 1st. But you will not be able to put in a start date prior to February the 1st. So even if you're getting ready ahead of time, you put entered the information, the start date cannot come before 2-1 of 18. So once you have all the information, you've added your providers in, you've got their start dates and their end dates, then you'll see that little uh, sign that says submit to CRM. And what that does is when you click on that, it takes the monthly funding, and I'll show you uh, in a moment where it'll show you the monthly amount of funds that's going to be allocated. It takes that, sends it to CRM. CRM will send that to Ohio Benefits and Ohio Benefits to uh, the MIT system so that the uh, providers can bill against that money. So this actually allocates the money on a monthly basis, just like with waiver nursing, where the funding is only per month and then it will send it over to the CRM and then be transmitted to MITS uh, for billing. Let's say that you, um, I, I put this in here so that you could see that if you decided to use an individual because you thought that they had the certification and you entered their information and you tried to submit, when you click on submit to uh, CRM, you're gonna receive an error message and it's gonna say who which provider that you, you put in. In this particular example, you had three different providers. When you put steps in as that last provider and you attempted to submit it to CRM, it will not go and it will say they're not certified to provide that service. And then once you've submitted to CRM, uh, you can go um, back to that cost projection details page and just like we're accustomed to looking at nursing, um, it gives you the monthly breakdown. Uh, on this particular example, it's, of course, it started in February, uh, and it shows you that here is the provider. Now, you'll see that the provider is going to have a name, and it's going to have their uh, contract number. It does not have whatever your allocation is. Like uh, when you have your meeting, and you may say, okay, provider A, um, you get six hours per month, and uh, provider B, you have four hours per month. It's not going to be allocated hours into the CPT. There's too many changes um, that it, it's just not, it would just be very um, tedious to try to keep up with the timing. So you're only going to enter, this is a provider, and this is the service, the consultation, the assessment, uh, and then, it will automatically feed into this cost projection details. It's only going to give you exactly what you've given in to when you entered your provider information, but it's not going to give you a detail like number of, uh, if you're looking at waiver nursing, you know how you get a number of bases, a number of subsequent. This is only going to give you the information that you see here. It has got um, their name, their contract number, and then you see the 40696. Now, in the earlier slides, I gave you the different rates 
for the RN agency, RN non-agency, RN assessment rates, RN consultation rates for agency, non-agency, as well as LPN agency and non-agency. But as you look at this uh, slide here, you see that every month it says 406.96. The reason is, what will automatically be allocated is the maximum amount that can be paid. Now, that's not to say that the providers can bill the maximum amount because MITS, by their billing code, MITS knows the providers and they know that based on this billing code and the person that's enrolled in this waiver, they know what the pay rate is. But in order to spare the county boards from having to uh, constantly adjust, uh, this time it's an RN, next time it's an LPN, this time it's an agency, a non-agency, so that you're not um, constantly adjusting the rates uh, in the CPT, we're gonna automatically just give it the maximum. And even if you have a, a provider that's going to start on February the 27th, when you enter provider A in, as an assessment visit and consultation, it is not going to prorate, it's going to automatically put that amount uh, as a flat rate, 406.96 into the February slot. Now, you may make adjustments. Let's say that in March you had provider A, but now provider B and C has joined in. So provider A, they may decrease the amount of units that they were providing because now we've got these other two providers and you do not have to make adjustments in the CPT short of just adding their names. But as I said earlier, you're not going to try to keep up with the number of units that this provider is uh, is giving as opposed to the other one because it will give you a flat rate, 406.96. Now, your ISP must delineate who's supposed to be billing what uh, because as I told you, uh, when the billing starts coming in and if someone is not paid uh, appropriately, they're gonna be contacting the county board. You'll have to pull uh, the information from data warehouse uh, to see who's billing, what provider is billing what code and what quantity and is that matching your authorization on your ISP. This in the CPT will give you the providers, their start date, their stop date, and then it's just going to be a flat rate of 406 uh, 96 going forward. Again, we put the maximum amount in order to ensure uh, that there would always be enough uh, funding uh, in provided to MITS uh, for, for the payment, whether it was an RN or an LPN or an agency or a non-agency, uh, the funding would be uh, correct so that there doesn't have to be an ongoing adjustment. Uh, and then after you've completed that and you want to go and look, uh, just like I, most of you, I think, uh, utilize uh, the version so that you can go back in and see what have you uh, already uh, authorized or submitted, uh, who's been, who's already, what providers are included, uh, whatever information you want to look at, you can go to the versions and look. And just like you've got uh, what you're accustomed to probably now is looking at the waiver or nursing or the nursing versions, and you'll see right alongside of it is the delegation versions. When you um, look at the delegation version, you see that the only status that you're going to see will be submitted or overwritten. So in this um, in this example, you see that back in November of, uh, the 29th of 2017, we had a submission and then there was a change at 8 a.m. and it has overwritten. Well, it was overwritten by the one on 11:29 at 9:10. Then that one was overwritten by 1129 something else but what I'm saying is it when you submit to CRM it'll change it to a submitted status but then when someone else or you come in the next day or next month or next year and you're making a change to that your submitted status will change to overwritten and now the change that you've just made will become the submitted status so the only thing when you look at the version 
Um, you'll only see submitted for the one that's currently in place at that moment or the overwritten, all of those that um, had been in the past. When you look at the nursing versions, you see uh, an approval, you may see uh, denied, you might see waiting uh, for authorization. So there's several different statuses in the waiver nursing versions, but in the nursing delegation version, it will only be submitted and overwritten. When you are on the version, um, you know how you can click on the view details and it will give you the breakdown um, of what, again, of what the, the total amount per month. And you see, for in this example, for February, you have one provider and you have their contract number and you've got the amount of 406.96. For March, now you have two providers and yet the total amount is still 406.96. If for April you had five, it would still be 406.96. So it's, it's an all amount put in, is that when you've checked that box that you've checked for RN consultation and assessment, again, we will give you the maximum amount to pay that's for an RN agency rate, again, so that there's not a constant adjustment required. But you will not see uh, let's say you had five providers and now you've decreased them to two. Still, it's going to be 406.96. There will be there will be no change to that. Now, I circle this because uh, if the county board, if you have access when you go to CRM and you uh, access the individual, and you see the name here, like with Tyler Wagner. Right underneath, you see where it says View Nursing Services. If you click on the View Nursing Service, it will give you, this is what the breakdown. Let's say on this particular example, this individual has both nursing and nursing delegation. So in the first column, you see 402. Now that's what waiver nursing uh, is being allowed, that 402.42. And you see delegation, there's nothing. And so the total amount of waiver funding that sends emits is 402.42. Same thing for the next one and the next one on down until all of a sudden we get to zeros. Now there's no services. I don't know what happened during those months, but there's no services. And then starting down uh, at the 406, you see where the services have been changed for a couple of months. There was no nursing and it was all changed to delegation. So you've got the delegation, consultation, again, you recognize the rate by now, 406.96. And that, uh, you see, is in the second column, again, the total amount being 406.96. Now, two months later, they started with nursing and with the delegation. So uh, for whatever reason, there was, uh, say there was a change in condition that required both the nursing care uh, for certain tasks and then for others, it could be performed through delegation. So you see that there's two, so that the total amount is $900.64. Now, this is where we have to look closely when it comes to, uh, to the billing aspect, because with MITS, it's a pot of $900.64. Whoever gets there to bill against it, it's going to get paid as long as that visit meets the criteria and meets the uh, the restrictions and the requirements of that particular visit, it's going to be paid. But if there should be a billing uh, problem, then we'd have to look at not only what did the allocation of nursing, delegation, consultation, assessment, who was allocated what and what quantity, but then we also would have to look at the nursing. Uh, if the nursing billed for $500, you see how that's going to bite into the amount of money that would be allocated for the assessment and consultation visits. So again, you're going to have to, if you're not accustomed to looking at the data warehouse, um, you need to get that way because the potential is going to be that, especially at the beginning, uh, when everyone's getting acclimated to how this all is going to function and how I'm going to bill and how I get paid and I didn't understand that I was only supposed to bill for this amount and I billed for the whole amount. 
So it, it's, it has the potential, uh, at least initially, to, to be somewhat confusing. So we have to be sure that you know, you as the county board, know that you've got, uh, if you've got nursing and delegation services in place, there's a specific allocation for the waiver nursing, as well as a specific allocation for the delegation. So that if there's a billing problem, we may have to look at both the, the waiver nursing as well as the delegation assessment and consultation to assure that everyone is getting paid appropriately or who didn't bill correctly uh, so that that can be corrected. If you have any questions uh, about this going forward, and you and you will, so you can just give me a call. Uh, again, uh, my number is 614-728-2524, or you can send me an email, and that's Donna, D-O-N-N-A, dot Patterson, at dod.ohio.gov, or you can send any questions to the TDD inbox, and that is TDD inbox at dod.ohio.gov. Again, uh, I usually answer the TDD inbox, or uh, Matt does, or Rick, but anyone would be able to help you. Or you can contact Rick Donnelly, uh, and again, his uh, email address is given richard.donnelly at dod.ohio.gov. Um, I think that's it. It's Although it may seem a bit complicated initially, I, I think that it once we get into the groove of it, it's, it's really not a, a complicated procedure, especially with the CPT. It's just a simple matter of putting in the provider, putting in the dates, and again, the uh, the cost will automatically uh, be given at the highest amount, the 40696, uh, and then the, the allocation, the specific allocation has to be uh, delineated in your ISP. So remember that we've got assessment, and that's for the RN only, to do the uh, initial assessment, make sure that her documentation, his or her documentation includes uh, what are the precipitating factors? Was this a hospital discharge? Was it a change in condition? Or are we initiating the services? And then that has to be done by an RN only. The consultation uh, is performed either by an RN or an LPN working on the supervision of an RN uh, that is meeting the particular needs of that individual, clarification or confirmation with physicians, and of course, uh, confirming with the uh, non-agency, I mean the non-licensed uh, provider to ensure uh, their competency uh, and any change uh, of condition or change of orders uh, that, that is going to be taken care of through that uh, consultation visit. The assessment rate is a flat rate and the consultation is paid in units. You'll account for the services through the CPT. Uh, it will be a month through the waiver. Uh, it'll be stored through in the CRM. CRM will uh, automatically send that information to MIT for the providers to bill against. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us and I appreciate your time and have a good one. Bye.